Um, I'm Nancy Erkenbrack, and I'm a member of the Pacific Northwest Felt Makers Group. And on behalf of that group, I'd like to welcome you all to session two of our four <laughs> sessions on felt making, which um, we've put together for the Portland Textile Month. So today is session two, and that's a Q&A on felting for garments or flexible fabric. Um, we're going to begin the presentation with a, our, the session today with a short presentation on felt making from the past through today. And Pat Spark and Flora Carlisle Kovash are with us today for that presentation. Before we move into that though, um, I wanna just remind folks that we will have a Q&A, so please hold your questions till after the presentation. You can write them in the chat section or raise your hand, which is a function on most devices under the more category. So um, if you have any questions, feel free to write them down um, or raise your hand and we'll call on you after the presentation, which will take us about 15 minutes. So with that, Pat, Flora, go ahead. Okay, I start the screen share in a minute. I would like feedback if you see the PDF yet or the PowerPoint. Yes, I see the PowerPoint, but it's in, uh, <laughs> it, it's not in screen share. It's not in screen view. You know, it's not in a slideshow view. It is in. Um, Do you see it now? We, I see it, but it's not still not in slideshow okay. view. So start, start. Okay. There we go. Okay. So when when we um, um, were talking or thinking about this topic, it, it occurred to me that we didn't have a lot of early information about um, uh, how felt making developed in terms of garment making. Uh, and uh, so I, I put together this little bit of information and um, and to, to kind of help us because we're in such a different place now with garments than we were, for instance, uh, at the, during the felt revival in the 1970s. So uh, if we could go next, please. So it is, it is tradition that in certain areas of the world, uh, felt is used to make garments, but they, uh, they have a certain style. Uh, and uh, like for instance, in Eastern Turkey and Anatolia, the shepherds wear a garment called a kepanek. And that a, a garment is also, uh, a garment like that is also worn in Iran. Uh, so it's, it's not, uh, you know, it's kind of in that region. Also there's um, in Dagestan, which is right across the um, border from, um, from, from the Republic of Georgia, which is still in that, kind of in that region kind of be between the Republic of Georgia and the Caspian Sea. Uh, the people there, uh, wear, uh, the men wear uh, a, a felt cloak called a burqa, and those have certain properties. Um, then um, when you go into other countries, get into other countries, you don't necessarily have um, a felted garment, garments per se, what you have is um, either woven or knitted and fold, or sometimes uh, um, 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 uh, knotless knitting, uh, so, some kind of a technique to make a structure, and then it's heavily fold, uh, and those are more flexible, and then they, they save um, the felt itself for accessories like hats and boots and so forth in, in colder climates. Next. So these are kepniks. Uh, you'll notice how stiff they are. They are meant to be worn uh, by the shepherds. Um, also notice in the, on the right um, that there are false sleeves. Oftentimes these false sleeves uh, have, uh, you can put things down into them, your lunch or you know whatever can go down in there. Um, but they are not um, used as sleeves and um, in order to get flexibility for a, a person's arms, uh, they make that slit below the sleeve. Or they're like the, uh, the cloak shape up above. 
and they were actually used as structures, or they possibly still are used as structures. Um, for instance, when it rains, uh, a shepherd would just sit down inside of the cloak. The cloak would stand up around them and make a, a little tent, a little mini tent. And then when the storm passed or whatever, they would stand back up and walk away with their cloak on. So very, um, uh, very practical items uh, for the shepherds to have. Next. But they were very he heavy. Very, very heavy to be able to sta stand by themselves. Yes, this is a burka. Uh, uh, this, so this is a man's garment from Dagestan and they are made white and then dyed black um, and they have a outside that looks like it's fleece like it's, uh, like it's from a sheep fiber it's you know like a skin but it's not a skin it's, it is actually a felt and there's one more picture of a burqa next I just found this picture on the internet yesterday I think it was so dramatic of this man wearing his burqa and you can again see how stiff that garment is. Next. So then you have cultures where they wear, uh, where they have uh, traditionally uh, made a garment um, that is woven and then heavily fold. Uh, the, the <laughs> okay, I'm gonna try and say it for Sur. Sur. Sur, the Sur uh, of Hungary. Uh, you'll notice again that the sleeves are not worn. It's worn on the shoulders like a like a mantle, like a cape, um, and it is a shepherd's garment. But it is a woven fabric that's been heavily, heavily fold. So it's it's also quite stiff. And then on the right, there's a a a, a coat that I a little jacket I saw um, that is um, uh, in the 2020 collection from North Style Company. And it is uh, what we would call boiled wool, which is a very, again, a very popular fabric, but it is quite um, firm, a firm fabric. So that's what we're starting. That's what was behind in the 1970s, what people were seeing, that's what they were thinking of when they were making felt garments. Go ahead. So this is the, the early revival movement, the early contemporary felt making. Uh, I, I think of that as a revival movement because, of course, felting has been here all along uh, in various cultures, but in, as a widespread phenomena of being used by artists and craftspeople, it is, it is uh, since, basically since the 1970s. And so people would make them, you'll find um, pictures, I couldn't find any of my pictures, by the way. Uh, they're all on slides and I don't know what happened to those slides from, from years ago. Um, but they're, they were made like, uh, very much like uh, people would make felt um, relatively thick and, and sew them together very, very much like the boiled wool garments. Uh, and they had very little flexibility. If they wanted flexibility, there was ways of, um, and we will have a PDF somewhere on, on our website that shows how I used to do it. But you could, you could um, uh, do, a, do a row of chain stitches along the edge of a piece of felt pick up those stitches with your knitting needles and then knit off of it and make you know fl more flexible um, collars and sleeves and so forth. So you had some give and you weren't walking around like this stiff uh, form. So people who were working in the 19, uh, uh, at least in the 1980s, uh, Regina uh, Berdinka Carey, Bobby Laducci, these are all people in the Northwest. Remember I live in the Northwest where the Pacific Northwest Felt Makers Group and I really can't see my other other ones there because I've got people covering it up. Yeah, I can't see it. Um, but other, there were, who else do I have on there? Um, oh, Sabina Miner. Let's, let's just go next. There's a, there's a lot of people I'm trying to find photos of. I wanted to show you Sabina Miner's work um, because she was doing some really wonderful things in the 80s, in the 1980s. And uh, kind of as a precursor to trying to get flexibility, she, she knit on her knitting machine uh, yardage and then felt it into it and uh, it, it looks very 80s I know that cocoon look it looks very 80s but it's, it's it's a really good idea and you get the then also if you look at the, the garment the vest on the right you'll see that that's the other way that people were working is they were oftentimes making plain with that stiffness and going ahead and making armor like like samurai warrior armor um, to make garments Next. And to, to carry that theme out, these are some felt vests made by Sabina uh, Miner 
for the Angel One episode on Star Trek Next Generation. The women, uh, the two women are wearing um, felted garments. Next. So into the 90s then, we had people um, starting to want more flexibility. And the first, the first um, person I work, I saw doing that was Helen uh, uh, Vider uh, Mashi from Switzerland. And I don't unfortunately have any photos of her work, but I wore, uh, she, we had a fashion show at the International Felting Conference in Aarhus, uh, Denmark in 1990. And she went around and got people, she didn't want models, ordinary, you know, she wanted ordinary people to wear her garments. And so I was one of the people that wore one of her garments and they, they were coat weight, but they were very flexible, very cuddly and nice. And, and I just remember just thinking, wow, this is just an amazing piece of felt. And she was combining um, fabrics and wool together in such a way as to uh, allow the fabric to hold some of that wool and create the structure. Uh, so uh, people started working with, uh, when I came back from, from, for instance, from Denmark, I started immediately experimenting, trying to figure out how I was going to make that happen for myself. And um, so I was using, and, and other people were using semi-transparent lightweight or lightweight gauzes attached to the wool fiber. Some of the names for it was, they were called sandwich felt, they were called fused felt, and I and several other people started calling it laminated felt. And then in uh, 1993 or thereabouts, Polly Sterling, Sterling and Shashiko Kotaka uh, coined the word Nuno for the, the very thin garments they were making uh, because they were trying to produce felt for a warm climate. Now, uh, that um, their main difference, uh, I just li listened to a lecture by, by Polly on, on YouTube, which is quite good if you can, you can go there. Um, th their main difference between what they were doing and what a lot of other people were doing, a lot of this other people, we were putting the cloth on top of the wool and they flipped it and then put the wool on top of the cloth. And so that was one of the big differences in what they were doing. And that led to those kinds of differences led to lots of uh, lots of amazing things after that. Next, go ahead. This is one of my garments. Um, it is uh, uh, a very thin nylon gauze on top of uh, 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 with an inclusion. I made this in, in 90, 1992. Uh, so it's got yarns in it, and then there's the, ga the black gauze on top and a white wool underneath. Uh, because of the size of the, of the nylon scarves that I was using, um, I had to piece everything together. So I started off with my garments were mainly pieced and not in one piece. Next. There's a detail. That's a detail of the uh, vest that shows the gauze. Next. The gauze made a in really interesting structure. These are some of um, Polly's uh, garments from the uh, late 1990s. So uh, the aspects of, of uh, felt making that we are, that uh, garment making that we are gonna be talking uh, about now is that um, things that have changed over the years is people are using the properties of the wool itself to create shaping and that's become very important and i don't know who first did this i do know that the first time i saw it was on the work of of um lubov uh, uh, voronina from uh, russia and how she was using going around the the, the bust area to get a to get uh shaping over the bust uh, with the fiber and how she was laying her fiber sideways to bring the waist in and you know she had a lot of things that she was doing i don't know if she's the first one who did that i don't know who did but she's the first one i saw and uh, then people started using much finer wools um, when i was first working uh, with merino i had spent most of my career as a as a felt maker using uh, romney which is quite coarse uh, compared to merino and so when I was using uh, 23 micron merino I thought I was you know using super fine and now then you know now I work with 19 and 18 and 16 and so forth so uh, that has changed the flexibility of the fabric uh, of the text of the felt uh, then the fabrics themselves are much lighter so the resulting uh, felts are like um, almost gossamer fine they're just amazingly fine 
And then people are also adding uh, fine cellulose fibers, such as viscose, with the wool. And they're sometimes even using the cellulose fibers instead of uh, an attached cloth. And in that way, uh, they're getting amazing flexibility. Do I have, is there more? I don't remember. Do I have another one in this? Or is that? Oh, I, I do. Sorry. I'm sorry, Flora. This is Flora's work. Uh, Flora was definitely working with the direction of the uh, fiber layout to get the shaping of the, in the, on the body form there. That's the front and back of that garment, the inside and the outside of that garment. Um, so you can see that uh, where the waist is, she's laid the fibers sideways and then uh, where, where the uh, other areas that she has gone with a vertical uh, configuration of fiber, really playing with the, the layout direction. Next, some more of Flora's uh, flexible works. I know Flora gives a very good workshop on making that marbled vest. And then some grid, uh, using a grid layout, some garments by Flora. You can see that there's so much more flexibility. Mm -hmm. So uh, some possible topics that we can be start uh, talking about in our discussion. Uh, what, kind, what are the wool qualities that people are using for various types of garments? Uh, what are the types of fabrics? Uh, layout, fiber layout, that is just so important to getting this flexibility. Uh, the use of cellulose fibers. Um, are there felting and fulling methods that, that create uh, greater flexibility and, than, than anything else that we might want? Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Pat. It was very interesting. I loved hearing about the history of, of felting. And welcome, welcome the latecomers. <laughs> um, we, we originally planned this session to be more about uh, questions and answers. So feel free to turn your cameras on. And uh, it would, I think, just to get started, would be nice if, if you type in the chat window where are you from and if you have experience with, with garment making. And, um, and if you have questions about, um, about this um, topic, then we can open it for discussion. To keep it, uh, to keep it uh, controlled, uh, um, just raise your hand, your blue palm, and we will, we will just call names and then you can, you can get through. Uh, so, picture <laughs> up here, but um, so yes, now you see, <laughs> and I I started making felt in the eighties and nineties, and um, and then I um, at some point became a nurse, and now I'm getting back into it again. Okay. I can't see who's talking. Who is talking? I think it was Bobby. If oh, hi, turn... Bobby! Hi, Bobby! <laughs> <laughs> if, if you turn your camera I, on, it's better. My picture up. I, I uh, let me see. Something came up. Okay. Start video. Okay. Oh, there I am. Hi. <laughs> I don't know if you can see me. Yes. <laughs> Good to see you. So, okay. So I'll um, I'll just put mute. I'll I'll go to mute now. <laughs> I'm so, trying to catch. I, I'm not seeing you, everybody, so I don't know. I'm not sure how to get to see. Oh, okay. Maybe. If, there's more people. Oh, you know, swipe the screen. Okay, Spark, you can do that. <laughs> uh, yeah. So, so Pat ended her conversation, her her lecture with, with some questions. We can start going through them, or or if you have questions uh, from your experience of felting garments, then we can we can start there. It's hard. It looks like it takes a little time to warm up. <laughs> <laughs> There's a question in the um, chat, Laura. Oh, uh, which one? 
Wendy? Wendy. So she says, I am a novice with sewing, interested in upcycling ideas to repurpose fabric. Um, have not worked with fag before. From New York. Wendy. Wendy, do you want to turn your camera on and your voice? <laughs> Yeah, we are, we are muted, so I have to unmute yourself first. Hi. Hi. <laughs> I'm not as advanced as you guys. Um, I have um, actually have family that lives in Portland, so I have, um, even though I'm from New York, I have been to Portland many times. <laughs> it's a great place. Um, are you located near the art museum where they had that? Um, I guess when I was there, I think it was Chihuly or Chihuly. He had the glass. Chihuly. Chihuly, yeah, yeah, it was, yeah. And then I uh, have been up by the uh, Japanese rose, the Japanese yeah. garden with the roses and to Powell's bookstore. I know there's a lot of, I know there's a lot of uh, activity in Portland these days, so. I guess sometimes most of us, uh, the Pacific year. Northwest Felters Group is basically a group of, of friends who are felt makers and we're all consider ourselves professional felt makers. And, oh. and we get to, we get together, um, some of us get together and have, uh, we have had little, little mini retreats, but we've just oh. officially been a group basically since January. We started meeting as a group. And then, of course, COVID happened, so now we're meeting via Zoom. But there's, uh, I believe, either eight or nine of us. And so we're yeah. from all over the Pacific uh, Northwest. Uh, oh. Uh, sorry, I, I, my, my, my phone went away. Yes. We're not an open Oh, that's group. great. Brenny, do you have a question? I do. I, I don't want to, um, I, I just wasn't that's sure. Okay. Okay, um, so Flora, I met you so many years ago at a craft uh, exhibition in Lake, Lake Oswego. Um, and following your work and on your website, I mean, you're just so talented and um, nice to see you here. Um, I'm not working in Felton the way you are. I, I do, I, I'm trying to make maybe more three dimensional objects, so I'm always looking for like ways to add structure rather than and, and flexibility using mm -hmm. but this is just a maybe kind of a dumb question i've never understood what does it mean to full like what does fulling actually mean oh okay but you are good good first. <laughs> that's a good question um uh you can make a, a structure uh, from fiber and that is that process of making that structure is uh we have very we don't have good english words for it but in English, uh, that process of making a structure out of fiber is called felting. Of course, you could also knit a fabric. You could weave a fabric. You could do knotless netting. You could crochet. As long as they're wool, you can create this structure, right? But then afterwards, after that initial structure is made, you have the opportunity to make it a very strong uh, structure with um, um, the ability to wear well and be a good, you know, like, be a good garment and so forth and that process that all any of those wool things can go through is called fulling so we have felting knitting weaving blah 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 blah. then we have fulling they can all be full <laughs> and that's that's uh, usually uh, um, not always but oftentimes with hotter water perhaps more vigorous activity um, you are trying to get all the fibers to really interlock together well and create a, a, a stronger textile. But isn't, isn't that what felting is though? I mean, felting No, is... fel felting, felting makes the initial textile, but it's not very strong and then you have to full it. Can I say Felting is basically line. helping the fibers to tangle, but you have to full it until it shrinks to the right size. It's a, it's a weird, it's a weird name and I've always found it to be kind of like it doesn't roll off the tongue very well. 
Um, I'm an interloper. I made wearable art for 30 years as a profession. Wow. And I made, um, I made wool garments from 1999 until seven years ago. And I uh, did fold the wool. And that's like a, that's a weird sounding name, but pulling literally, and now everything I do is three dimensional. I don't do any garments anymore. And, mm -hmm. and the word fulling is just weird, but it also, it means that you're gonna, like if you're doing three dimensional sculpture, you're literally making it from, a, from a, something that's fluff to something that is sturdy and that stands on its own. Um, but it is a weird name because felting always seemed to be the thing that actually made sense for what we do. But fulling seems to be the structural work that you get when you finish mm -hmm. completely shrinking something so that it doesn't go any further. Is that correct? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. We. It, it's just the English is inadequate for describing. <laughs> I, I, uh, uh, describing. Uh, so that's that's the part of the problem is that that uh, other other languages have more words to describe what's going on and and we don't we just have those two so and and, and it's hard to find that line between okay you're you're felting 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 and you're fulling 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 now where is that line exactly. and it, 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 it there isn't a line um, may I, so may i interject just a moment i see um let's see to... Who is the uh, Bobby? You are unmuted. You have to mute. You have to unmute yourself, Bobby. Okay. Yeah. Okay. We didn't hear anything, so start all over again. <laughs> Can you? Okay. Um, felt is a non-woven fabric, so you're simply felting or having uh, the fibers um, jo joined together in the felting process to make a fabric. Fulling happens with a woven fabric mm. or knitted fabric. So it already has a structure and it's like boiled wool, if you know what that is. That, that's how I understand the two anyway. Yeah, and the, di know the difficulty with that it. is that, you know, I, I used to be a printmaker and printmakers use felts yeah. uh, on their presses and they call them felts and they are a woven and, and heavily fold textile. So, huh. you know, it's, it's, um, uh, there are woven felts, uh, the, there are, uh, the, the French beret is a knitted felt. So, it, you know, it's kind of hard to, to say felt is only a non-woven, uh, or, or a non-woven textile because there are, there, that term is, is like I said, English is inadequate. Yeah. Why don't we talk about something uh, like like some people wanted to know about um, uh, where we get sixteen micron fiber. Uh, that was one of the questions I saw that came up. Uh, let's let's talk about things other than an argument that we're going to get into about the definition of words, um, because there. I mean, what's important is what we're doing, not necessarily what we call it. <laughs> Um, so if, if, um, uh, anybody have ideas, I mean, I would get mine, uh, from a, a DHG supplier, DHG, the Italian company, uh, Die House, uh, something, I don't, can't remember what the G stands for, um, because they, they seem to be really, con for me, they're really consistent and if, when they're selling the various types of fibers, and that's where I would find someone who was selling that, and then I would buy it from them, but... Anyone else have a favorite place that they're getting uh, 16 micron? I actually use 19 micron in all of my work. Um, and I, I don't feel that the, the difference between the microns versus the price difference, but that's just my opinion. I like uh, in, uh, break, uh, necklaces and uh, bracelets and things. I like the, the finer micron. Mm -hmm. uh, it doesn't seem to peel as much. I can get a tighter felt. and. Um, so I'm using it for that mm -hmm. and those are small things so <laughs> I'm not using a lot of it yeah I don't know any other supplier either I don't know the DHE uh, yeah they're they're kind of uh, a standard supplier for that you could go on Etsy and just type in 16 micron wool and yeah, they, they are located in Italy but they have several suppliers 
So it yeah. might first it might be first to do a little research on Etsy or uh, or just Google and and see if you can see some somebody who is uh, local. And uh, mm -hmm. yeah, they have local suppliers all over the world. You guys know World of Wool? Do they have that kind of um, merino? That's in England, right? Uh huh. I'm uh, sure they would. Yeah. No, they no? don't. No, no, no. I, I don't I don't buy from them, so I don't know. So and I, not that I wouldn't buy from them. I just it's not convenient for me to buy from them. So. So we have another question from Sarah Hopkins. Maybe Sarah can. Do you want to please unmute yourself? Yeah. Sure. Good morning. Thank you. Yeah, I had a, a, a question. I think the a big challenge for me is um, when to stop and just personality wise, I'm kind of the person who never stops. And so yesterday I was playing around with um, trying to do better at getting an even uh, chevron, light chevron layout. So I, so I did several eight and a half by 11 chevron layouts and then I used um, a thin layer of viscose on it. And, um, and I sanded it and I rolled it, you know, and I rubbed it a little bit. And I just felt that when I, um, rinsed it and dried it that the wool just didn't yet feel feel mm -hmm. like it was ready right so then I did more and more and more and it and it and I got it to where I feel very confident yeah this wool is fully felted and fold but it's at 50 percent of the size it's so it shrank so much mm -hmm. and 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 this uh, this just seems to happen to me all the time that I feel like I've taken it maybe farther than I needed to take it but I'm just, I'm, I'm wondering if, um, is it possible to leap too quickly? It's like that, that question about when do you stop felting and start fulling? If I wanted less shrinkage, but still wanted the wool to have that really finished feeling and look to it. So, Sarah, in my, my opinion, and it's a, I think it's a really great uh, discussion topic because we have very many uh, experiences from very different backgrounds. But I believe that once, once you get to the stage where you cannot remove fibers with your finger, I think that's the stage where you can consider it felted. The pinch How, not pinch test, but no. pinch test is when you lift the fibers and you lift a little pyro bit of fibers so that tells you that the fibers already started connecting. But if you go to a fatted surface and you try to remove fibers, there might be some guard hairs that, that come up, comes out, but, but it's really hard to remove fibers from the fat. Then I consider it food. And once, once you get to that stage, actually, you can still apply hot water and more agitation and, and go and fat it even further. So for fat it's scarves, or, or uh, um, main, yeah, mainly scarves, where I, I like to get to the stage where you cannot remove fibers anymore. But when I make hats, I, I even want to fat it further until it doesn't shrink anymore. So that's 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 the two stages of uh, fat that I uh, differentiate. Because when you want something around the neck, it has to be more drapey and more uh, soft. Exactly. Yeah, but still, it has to get this, to that stage where the fibers are very strongly connected, and that's also um, that also helps you to get to 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 create a fat where peeling is less likely because the softer or less fatted, less fluid your fat is, the more peeling you get. That's what, what do you guys think? I've also, I've also found that um, uh, maybe it's just because I'm old, but when I um, make felt one day, uh, for, you know, for the day, um, and then I think it's done, I'll rinse it, uh, I like to get the soap off by putting it in some vinegar water, soak it, and so forth. And then I let it dry, and then I look at it the next day um, and go, "Oh, yeah, no, you should have gone more longer," you know. And so then I'll fill, uh, then I'll fill it some more. So um, just because it, I, I can, I can, like Flora says, I can see the fibers; they're still kind of just a little soft. The water held them together, and they're just still a little soft on that inside layer. And I just going, "Oh no, that is just not going to work." And so then I, uh, then I full longer. And that was what I saw yesterday, exactly that, Pat. So that's why I went back in. And, but then yeah. 
Thanks so much. And it gets, my scarves tend to have too much structure, I think, because I overwork them. So yeah, so actually a nice thing to have with your texture, isn't it? No, no, she said structure and uh, stiffness. Too much structure, too oh. stiff. So they oh, just, you know, yeah. you know yeah, like yeah. thing. So, yeah. so there are some techniques um, that I'm d just learning about um, that are some Russian techniques where the fibers, um, uh, supposedly the fiber, I don't know if this is true, supposedly the fibers go more horizontally and connect and make a stronger felt this way. They are still grabbing onto the textiles or whatever else you've put on them, but they but it's not a lot of uh, vertical movement, it's more horizontal. Uh, there's techniques that they're doing. Uh, there's something called air fooling, which is um, uh, pretty cool. You know, you're, you're, you take something and you, you're, you're fooling it. You're actually holding it up in the air and going like this, like a concertina back and forth. And, and it, it just does amazing work and it doesn't, um, it doesn't force those fibers by when you're hitting against the table, you're forcing those fibers on the surface. It's, but it's still making it a super uh, flexible but hard felt. And it's just amazing. So um, yeah, there are some really interesting things. There's something called bicycling that people are doing where you're just going like this for fooling. And that, you know, makes very strong forearms, but it, it just is it's just a, it's a really cool technique. And there's one called the wave where you've got your piece on the table and you just flick it you know once it's holding together it's just and, and you and, and with that kind of and it's a, i just i'm so amazed at that that the fooling methods and they are they are making flexible but quite strong felts so i you know i i kind of maybe look at some of the russians and see what see some of that cool stuff because it is uh Someone asked, said, asked a question about eco printing on felt. It's wonderful to eco print on felt, easy to do. So <laughs> I love it. It's, it's great fun. So there was a question from Patty Barker. If Patty'd like to unmute and ask her question. Well, I took the I took the question mark down because it was really about term terminology and. Pat didn't want to go there, so um, <laughs> I, I'm always. We can do it out later, Patty. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I'm just wondering if if there's any sort of source with definitions because, you know, um, one book will say stained glass is this, and another person will right, present right, right, technique, right. and so there's a lot of confusion over what is what and. Um, moon quilting versus mosaics versus you know and when i do a lot of um double faced nuno with a sheer gauze um herringbone layer of wool and a sheer habitat on top and people and i when i post it people say what is double faced nuno and, it, and you know it comes back to your sandwich um terminology yeah 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 anyway I, so yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll have to figure that out someday and post. Maybe IFA would be a good place to post def definitions if we could all agree. Yeah, I, I don't think we ever all agree. And, and I think that um, maybe uh, that having a term is okay. Uh, and it's, uh, but it, it, it's, it's sometimes it, the term has to have an explanation with it or a, a visual of what that is. And then, and then we can use that term. Um, Good idea. You know, when I'm when I'm when I'm talking with certain people, I'll use a certain term, and when I'm talking with other people, I'll use for the same technique. I'll use a different term. You know, so I just try to, you know, it's, then, it's like speaking other languages. You just try to keep them all in your head at the same time. Yeah, interesting. Okay, well, that was all. I don't think I don't think we're gonna get. I don't think we would get, especially not now with the millions of people who are making felt. I, I don't think we would ever get an agreement, uh, especially with uh, within the ling English language is when it is um, spoken differently and has different meanings from uh, with each country that speaks English. So um, good point. You know. Thank you. I, I try to just kind of describe something if I'm online trying to talk about it. I try to kind of describe it, and then I'll use uh, I'll use that term when I'm describing it, and then I'll use that term throughout whatever I'm writing, you know, uh, and then, then people will kind of know that that's what I, at that moment, and you know, the next day I might change my mind and call it something else, but at that moment, 
I'm calling it that. Hey, Mandy, you doesn't sound very optimistic about this topic in your comment. <laughs> she says we are going to never agree. But I think it's very important to have terms to refer to. And, and I do agree with Patty that IFA could take the, the responsibility for it and, and start using terms so we know what we are talking about. I think that's a great idea. So we have yeah, there was uh, another question from Wendy. I'll make a note of that and um, see what we can do. Yeah, let's propose. <laughs> yeah. There was a question about prefelts. Um, what is a prefelt? Um, and that's another thing that uh, uh, people have different feelings for what that is and, um, and how. Um, it, it that it, uh, there's, it's a term that has come to be known more it, at, at different times. It's been called soft felt or partial felt. Um, in some ways, maybe partial felt is um, uh, the uh, uh, kind of a kind of a, a better term in some ways. Maybe uh, that's just my opinion. But it, yeah, it's, it is. A, it, it, uh, when I define it, I think of it as. Um, a partially made piece piece of felt. So the felt itself is not through the stage of fulling. It's before the stage of fulling. And so uh, people, some people stop very soon. They just barely have it holding together, uh, have a very soft one. Uh, some people go farther and, and it's quite hard, but it still is able to uh, grab onto other surfaces, other wool fiber surfaces. It has to do with the ability to use that that partially made material in certain certain ways, so that you can cut it up or whatever, and and use it as a, a design element, or perhaps um, you're wanting to control a certain kind of shrinkage, so you're going to um, uh, partially felt your base before you add things onto it. So that then you won't get as if you if you have a let's say you have a design in your your silk that's really gorgeous and you don't want it to get super 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 wrinkled up, you partially felt the wool you're going to put it onto, then you put the silk onto that, and then when you fold that down, the silk doesn't uh, um, doesn't distort as much, um, you know it, it it'll it'll grab it, but it won't distort it. So, I mean, there's reasons for using it, but it's, it's, it's at different stages of making felt that you could call it a partially made piece of felt. And that would be what people call pre-felts. There are also commercially made pre-felts that um, you buy from different companies uh, that are different thicknesses, uh, made with different fibers, and they're uh, quite often, uh, they've been needle punched on a needle punch machine first. And so they're needled together they're all tangled together and they're different thicknesses and you buy them oftentimes by weight. Um, and, and they have the same uh, properties as um, other pre-felts do. Let me see, this is a, I took a workshop one time from Pam de Groot and this was, a, this was all done with, this was a, my first botanical printing and it was all done with commercially made pre-felts. That garment, so. Anybody else have something to say about prefelts? I think as long as you can remove fibers easily, it's it's considered prefelt. And once you cannot remove fibers easily, then it's full. And it also means that as long as you can attach, we add more fibers, it's still prefelt. And once you cannot add more fibers, then it's full. Fat, fat. And it really changes. I mean, I was first making prefelts. You know, I, not only did I have to walk through the snow and and uh, shovel it as I was going, and then it you know it was all uphill. But uh, <laughs> uh, we didn't. We weren't using merino. We were. I was using Romney, and it had to be quite soft to still attach because Romney makes a pretty tough skin pretty soon you know I mean it makes a skin it doesn't make a good solid felt for a while but it makes a skin that's hard to attach on to at least it was for me in those days so um, different qualities of fiber you're going to have at different places you have to stop to where you could still use it for an attachment I mean I think caracol would be different um, you know they're all different for that experimentation would be important. Of course, we're talking about felted garments and you probably wouldn't be using caracal for a felted garment, so never mind. 
So we had another question from Wendy uh, about materials. Yeah, hi, everybody. I just wanted to know if I um, want to make a scarf or a hat, would that be possible using um, some kind of felt that is machine washable? I just like to wash my things a lot, so I don't know if that's even a possible. I think if you make hats, bags, or boots, or slippers, you can feel them so strong that you can wash them in the washing machine. But if, oh. you, if you want to make variable art like scarves or garments, you, you maybe don't want to go that far because it's going to be really stiff. They can still be hand washed. Uh, okay. They can still be hand washed. There's a, there is something called uh, super wash wool that people uh, use for other products, but it is uh, wool fiber that's been coated um, with a material, a, a substance that prevents it from making felt. And so it is quite uh, a problem to use it for felt making. Uh, I had a student bring it to a class one time and tried to, we were making hats. And so obviously she, her hat never got made because it would not make felt because it was super wash. Okay. It meant not to felt. So you have to be careful with what you're choosing because it, there are things that are meant to not make felt. Okay, so for a starting project, um, it sounds like you was rec um, um, the recommendation was either slippers or hat. What, hat, okay. Or bags. Or a bag, okay. Or if you like really stiff coat, you can make those. Oh, okay. And what what um, gauge or thickness of um, felt would that be? What would it what it would be called? If it touches your skin, anything nineteen micron or finer, I would say Nin nineteen micron. Yeah, so if you make hats, you want something that's not scratchy. But if you want to make slippers, you can use really coarse wood and. Because you usually wear socks in the slippers. Right. Okay. Oh, that's sounds... yeah. And uh, so it, it, we're not talking about commercially made piece of felt that you're going to cut up and, and sew together. We are talking about the fiber itself that would make the sheet of felt that you might then cut up and use. Or you could actually, in the process of making the felt, you could make it a, a dimensional piece. Okay. So what what um what supplies or materials would I actually be buying? You'd be buying fiber. Wool, buy fiber. Wool fiber, wool fiber. Okay. And is that from that supplier you mentioned, DHG? Uh, you could, if you were, you could. Uh, there's probably, you're in upstate New York, did you say? Or in, in, in um, Manhattan? Or? A suburb of Manhattan. Okay. Um, yeah, there used to be a really good uh, fiber supply store in, in Brooklyn, but they uh, they moved away. Um, so I don't really know where in in uh, in the the boroughs you could uh, you know buy it, but um, there are places that sell fiber all through uh, New England, and uh, and especially farmers who have fiber. Um, and I know you're not, that, that this would be, so right about now, that would be the, the, um, the New York uh, Flock and Fiber Festival or whatever it's called, something like that, the New York one. Um, that would have been a good place to go, but they didn't have it this year because of COVID. So yeah. that, that's a problem, but um, you know what I used to do? I don't know if you can still do this, but when I used to go to a new area of the country just for fun, I would contact the local, um, um, some kind of guild? Agent? No, the extension agent. The extension agent for the U.S. Agriculture Department would know who was who had what kind of products uh, huh. that were agricultural. And I would contact them, and they would say, "Oh yeah, we've got these these people over here are selling this kind of wool, and people over there are selling that kind of wool." And huh? Extension like agent. Okay. That would okay. that would mean you'd be getting actual fleece. Uh, fiber it, fiber that hasn't been washed or anything and but some of them sell fiber that's been processed 
Wendy, okay. I think if you contacted local yarn stores, they could also probably direct you to where you might be able to call fiber, call roving. Yes, how yeah, you, you would how you'd be looking how for roving or bats, bats or you, roving. How do you spell that? R O V V V, v like in Victor, I N G. Uh -huh. Okay, or, roving or bats it's a different a different form of processing but it still is used for felting b a t t s okay okay you can also look for something called top t o p top okay okay r h r h lindsay sells all kinds of they're in philadelphia which is real you know not really close but relatively close to you Mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. Closer than Oregon to you. So yeah. R H Lindsay uh, company and uh, they sell fiber. Are all, there other all, questions? All, all different um, ways of No, that that's good. Um, no, that, that that's a good start for me. I, I can tell I probably have to do some personal research on this. Yeah. <laughs> so I do I do appreciate your help. I need to go because um, I have another meeting at two o'clock and I have to prepare. And I got my flu vaccine, so I'm a little bit out of it today. So Ooh, okay, well. <laughs> okay, I'm okay. Okay, but um, I, I feel like yeah, I don't know with COVID, I always feel like I have to. Yes. <laughs> well, thank you. After There's I a go message to... for you in Goodbye. the chat window. Don't forget to check it out before you leave. I'm sorry, what check, message? Check out the, the, the chat window before you leave. There's a message for you. Oh, thank you so much. I look forward, by the way, to going back okay. to Portland. Thanks. My fa Thanks for coming. Yeah, it's a, it's a great place. And you guys have a great group. <laughs> Just in closing, I had a cooking group, which is whole food plant-based. And um, so I know the value of having like a group <laughs> together, sharing yeah. ideas about things. It's really... Yes. Okay. Thank you. I'm going to check the chat window and all the best to everybody. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, everybody. <clears throat> Another question? Patty, did you have, a, have something to say? You always have something to say. <laughs> <laughs> if I'm obnoxious, I'm sorry. <laughs> you are not obnoxious. I just, I just <laughs> like hearing you talk. Oh, thank you. Um, I just don't want to tread on anyone else. Um, I was sharing in the notes, I, I just actually just put a class together about pre-felt and I did a lot of research before I um, wrote the curriculum and, um, you know, I, I started going down this rabbit hole with the Shibori design where you trap things in the pre-felt and then felt it further and oh my god, I'm, I'm an, I'm, I've got another addiction. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But um, anyway, I one of the things I I really love about prefelt is that you can get really crisp shapes on on a surface mm -hmm. design if you're doing a um, any kind of pattern or painting even with you know fabrics and and prefelts and um, the the edges remain a lot sharper than you can get just by laying wool out i think unless you're using needle felting of course you can get real crisp designs yeah. way, but yeah um, and i stumbled upon um catherine o'leary's book felt forward which is fairly new i think mm -hmm. and um she does a lot of work with with pre-felts but they're just so much fun anyway i just wanted to share those yeah. those thoughts <laughs> because it's you know um, I, was gonna, I I forgot to tell you Patty that I went back and, and looked more closely at Tasha's uh, faces from last week oh, that you, we were talking about and those are not yarn lines those are um, uh, 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 gauze uh, silk gauze oh, line wow that's fantastic around. I know pretty she's, yeah she's really she's amazing so work. yeah yeah. yeah, she is really talented. Yes, you're right. <laughs> and whimsical. Yeah, no, I look in there that you can see the, the woven structure in them oh, when okay. you get, get close to it. Yeah. Well, thank you for that, because I, I do a little bit of that, but um, wow, not anything like her details. So that was really fun to see. <clears throat> thank you for sharing. It, you're welcome. Uh, so there are some people saying other interesting things. And Mandy is having a, uh, Mandy, you are having a demonstration on this technique. Uh, 
what which the i'm uh, using prefels to do imagery with or uh, on the shibori on the pleated shibori. Oh, shibori prefels yeah okay yeah yeah um it's not shibori it's it's, it's um based on canadian smocking but it's oh uh, that's right oh i'm really excited pleated, yeah. about that so cool yeah the things you're doing are so so cool so very yeah. Oh, the like, yeah, yeah, the colours. You can do so much with it. It's just amazing. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I'm really excited by that. That's very cool. So Sarah had a question about that. Does anybody have anything for her on creating the shibori type pleats? Any advice? Um, my, my, I first learned about it from Mario Line uh, Delanga. Um, and she does workshops mm -hmm. on it. And then uh, another person who is working a lot with um, uh, pre felt, shiburi pre felt to make things is Anna May Koenen from Holland. And she is starting a series of workshops, uh, online Zoom classes, uh, starting up in a couple weeks. So, and Mandy, is yours a uh, class or a demonstration? We can't hear you to unmute okay. yourself. There you go. Um, it's, it's a demonstration because um, I, I, I can't really teach it via Zoom as a, it's, it's much easier for me to demonstrate and then you can watch the recording and play back and do it yourself when. So if and then, Sarah wanted to find a recording of this, it would be available? No, the workshop, if you want to email me, I think I put my email in the chat, chat um, room. Okay. Great. I, I Thank you. Emails. It's at the end of the, the, the live one is at the end of the month. Um, and then the recording will be available thereafter. Thanks, Very Mandy. Cool. Yeah, that, I, it just, it looks like such an exciting technique, Mandy. Very, very interesting. <laughs> I have a question for Mandy. Hi, Mandy. Hi. Um, so the, um, the, the workshop that you're doing, uh, it, it's available for purchase on your site if, if we can't attend live? Yeah, yeah. I'm, 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 I'm still in the recording because I, when I scheduled it, I forgot about you Americans. And I <laughs> in the morning UK time, so you'd have to get up. <laughs> I'm recording it so that you can watch it afterwards. Perfect. Thank you. I, I appreciate Anime's classes coming from Holland because she does them at seven o'clock Dutch time, which is, um, I think that's 10 in the morning uh, Pacific Coast time. So, it, you know, it's fine. It works out great. <laughs> the people from New Zealand and Australia have a hard time, however. <laughs> she has to do separate classes for them. I haven't looked at the chat. Is there any more questions in there that we need? Mm. Can you briefly explain what shibori pleating is? Um, the, the term shibori means uh, to bind. Um, and it, 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 with felting, it's a little bit different. Um, it's kind of like you're, you're, um, you are, uh, I'll try to, this is not a pre-felt, but imagine if this was a pre-felt. And there's so many different ways of doing it, but I'll just, give you a, a possibility so here's here's you've you have a fabric with and you can pleat it you can put a resist in the middle and and, and do big basting stitches so that you are grabbing those um wool fibers together of that pre-felt and then uh then you can cont continue to felt and uh and then full it and where those are held together uh, and this is just one way, but the way where those are held together, that will grab and hold on to each other and uh, will make it as a solid piece of felt. I mean, that's, that's uh, one way of doing it. There's, there's, you know, there's lots of different ways of doing it. So that's just one possibility. Well, our time's about up. So I want to invite everyone back next week. Our topic is um, visible mending and flora. Mm -hmm. Is in charge. <laughs> um, presenting that and that discussion. So thank you all for joining us today and we hope to see you next week for session three. And remember two weeks from now we are going to talk about uh, thick felt.
right? Structural felt? Yes. Structural felt, uh, sculptural. Yeah. So I've, been, so coming. I've, been, I've been watching your classes. You had like weekly classes for a while. Was it all spring or something? Yeah, well, I had I had these Mending Mondays. Yeah, Mending Mondays. I loved your class. Thank you. They were fun to watch. Thank you. <laughs> All right, thank you. <clears throat> thank you for being here. It's fun seeing you guys. Thank and remember, you so remember, you can find us. Uh, <clears throat> you will be able to find us on. Uh, <clears throat> There'll be a link to it on the uh, Facebook page for Pacific Northwest Felters Group. Uh, there'll be a link to it, and then it will probably, it's going to show up on our website, right? Isn't that true, Flora? Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm going to make a new Eventually. website. But, yeah. <laughs> it it's like we are, we are being so busy, I'm going to start a YouTube channel. Flora, <laughs> <laughs> stop happening. Yeah. Laura, do we have to sign up again for next week? Sign up again. For, for these Friday classes, there are individual registration links. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So where will I find where will I find to register for next week? We are gonna post it on the Facebook group and we'll also share it on our individual groups. And it will take uh, probably a couple of days. I wouldn't look for it before Sunday because they're having to take down this week's to put up next week's. And it, right. it, it'll okay. be at the